This is going to be John chapter 5, starting in verse 17. And we're going to look at the subject of the God-man. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This is the most hated and most loved, most mysterious, most talked about man who ever lived. He is the ultimate savior, the ultimate hero. All the comic book heroes rolled into one can't compare to the God-man. He's not just man, he's also fully God. But John 5, 17 says, But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. The fact that Jesus called himself the Son of God showed that he was claiming deity, that is, his godhood. The fact that he is God. And many of the comic book heroes are referred to as gods. But this hero, the God-man, is the God of gods. Deuteronomy 10.17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. But when an athlete does something incredible, like an ankle breaker or a long touchdown pass or a home run, they say he's in God mode. But those are a bunch of sissies compared to the Lord. There's not just a moment when he's in God mode. Jesus Christ, the God man, he's always God and has always been. There was a never a time when he wasn't God. John 5.18 says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Every superhero has somebody that wants to kill him. If you've seen any superheroes, uh, if you've watched those movies, those Marvel movies, I, I'm not saying I support those movies, but they all have enemies that want to kill him. And they want to kill Jesus because his works are righteous and theirs are evil. Just like Spider-Man had villains like the Green Goblin and that octopus guy and the, the Sandman guy. If you watch those cartoons as a kid, just like Superman had Lex Luthor and all those people. Jesus Christ, the God-man, also has enemies. Jesus had a bunch of devil-possessed Pharisees just waiting to, ki to kill him. They wanted him dead. John 5, 19 says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Once again, Jesus is claiming his Godhood. He says he does whatever the Father does, and you can't do whatsoever the Father does unless you're God. I can't do what the Father does, but Jesus can because he's God. Now verse 20, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. This is an incredible power that the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, has. Because the Father showeth him all things, that means he is omniscient. He knows everything. He's got unlimited knowledge to know what to do in every situation. John 5.20 For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. Notice it said that ye may marvel. Psalms 9 talks about the marvelous works of God. And they name those comic books and those superhero movies are made after a company called Marvel. They make all those big blockbuster Marvel movies. But wait until you see the Lord in real life before your eyes in a glorified body, which is described in detail in Revelation chapter 1. As you've read before, it said he has eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. It's going to be something to see the Lord Jesus Christ in his glorified body. Now verse 21 in John chapter 5 says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. 
Here the Lord is claiming to have the power to bring back someone from the dead. Now talk about a real superpower. Even if he arrived late on the scene, he could revive any of everyone that died. And that word quickeneth means to make alive. All these magicians, they claim to raise the dead. A lot of charismatic preachers lie about raising the dead. But the Lord can do it. The God-man can raise the dead. He has that power. Now verse 22 and 23, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Since the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are one God, if you don't honor the, honor the Father, then you don't honor the Son. And if you don't honor the Son, you don't honor, honor the Father. If you don't honor the Holy Spirit, you don't honor the Son or the Father. One God made up of three persons. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You deny one and you deny the whole thing. John five twenty four says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is past from death unto life. So another villain to the God-man was death, but death is no match for the God-man. God-man came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came down as God in the flesh. He lived a sinless life, died on the cross, was buried, but he conquered death because he got up out of the grave by his own power. He triumphed over death, his enemy, All our enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now everybody that gets in Jesus Christ, the God-man, by believing on him to pay their sin debt, they pass from death unto life. And one day the Bible says there's going to be no more death. You're not going to have to worry about burying anybody else one day because of Jesus Christ, the God-man. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's you if you've been born again. You've passed from death unto life. And the God-man is the ultimate Savior. Before you were saved, the wrath of God was on you, and you were being dangled over the flames of hell. All it would have taken for you to go to hell is for your heart to stop beating. But you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So he picked you up out of God's wrath. He grabbed you by the hand. And now the only way you can go to hell is if he removed his hand out from under you. Which he won't. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. But the God man is a strong man. And if Superman and the Hulk and Thor... And all these other heroes got in a tug-of-war match with the God-man. They would lose. He's got all power. He's all-powerful. John 10, 28 and 29 says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they, sh they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Uh, you can't get out of the Lord Jesus Christ's body. Once you get put in the body of Christ, nobody is strong enough to snatch you out. Now, John 5, 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. And many people try to make you believe they can talk to the dead. And they may be talking to an evil spirit, but it's definitely not a dead person. But the God-man is the one with this power. Not only that, but it's against his law for any human to talk to the dead, according to verses in Deuteronomy 18. But the dead can hear the voice of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And Revelation 1.15 says, His voice is as the sound of many waters. One of these days, the dead are going to hear that voice of the God-man, and they're going to come up because the God-man has that power to talk to the dead. Revelation 20 and verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years.
Now, John five twenty six through 29. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. The first resurrection is in three parts. Jesus Christ resurrected on the third day, and the Old Testament saints with him. The church is resurrected at the rapture. The tribulation saints are resurrected at the end of the tribulation before the millennium. And also many of the martyred tribulation saints. And you want to be a part of that first resurrection. The second one's not good. You don't want to be a part of the resurrection of damnation. But the God-man is a righteous judge. He'll judge the saints at the judgment seat of Christ. He'll judge the nations in Matthew 25. He'll judge the wicked at the great white throne who are a part of this resurrection of damnation. Revelation 20 Verses 11 through 14 tell us about this great white throne. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and on him, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You don't want to be a part of that second death. The, way, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. And that's not just a physical death, but also a second death when you're cast into the lake of fire. Now John 5.30 says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. And the will of the Son is always the will of the Father. His judgment is just. John 5.31, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Uh, the God-man doesn't have to brag about himself. He doesn't have to self-promote. You see these false godlike athletes today, and they just brag on themselves. Watch them walk down the tunnels before the game like James Harden and Russell Westbrook, and you're just going to see pride all over their face. Many people have the temptation of pride and self-promotion. But the Lord doesn't have to bear witness of himself. He says in John 5.32, There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he testifieth of me is true. John the Baptist, Baptist bore witness of him. The Scriptures and the Holy Spirit bore witness of him. And we need to bear witness of Jesus Christ, the God-man, and how he saves us. Is it, is, through your daily life, do you bear witness of Jesus Christ? Do you tell people he died on the cross for your sins, he was buried and resurrected? Do you let people know when they uh, don't understand that Jesus is God, that he is God manifested in the flesh? There's all kinds of cults and false beliefs that say Jesus Christ was just a man or just a good teacher or just a prophet. But he's actually a lot more than that. He's God manifested in the flesh. And he actually left the riches of heaven and came down and became poor lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins so that we could come to him as a guilty sinner and believe the gospel and be saved and get to go to heaven. He's the ultimate savior and the ultimate hero. And it's, it's a shame that many people are entering hell every day because they reject a way out. They reject salvation. How crazy would it be for you to uh, know your house is burning down, somebody's telling you your house is burning down, and you just stay in it. That's really what you're doing. You're just staying in your sin, and one day your heart's going to quit beating, and you're going to wake up in hell. But the Bible makes it clear. Salvation is by grace, through faith, without works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, 
Never has it been by works. Nobody ever got to heaven by living a good life. We get there through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that you'll come to Jesus Christ today as a guilty sinner and just believe on Him. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anybody, no matter what you've done, the filthiest, nastiest, wicked person can come to Jesus Christ and be saved. John 5, 31 says, If I bear witness of myself... My witness is not true. Jesus didn't have to bear witness of himself. He had many witnesses. But Jesus Christ is witness that he himself is God manifested in the flesh. John 8, 58 says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. John ten thirty says, I and my Father are one. Uh, Jesus wasn't the only one to bear witness of Jesus Christ. John 5.32 says, There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. You know who witnessed of Jesus Christ being God? One of the greatest preachers who ever lived, which is John the Baptist. John 5.33-34 says, Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. Jesus was only mentioning John because people will pay attention to what a regular man says many times before they will listen to what God says. Jesus claiming to be God was enough of a witness, but people like the witness of a man. In John 1, 29 and 30, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me. John bear witness that even though he himself was born before Jesus, he said that Jesus was before him, recognizing that Jesus wasn't just a man, but eternal God. He said he was before me. John the Baptist was born first, but he recognized that Jesus was before him because Jesus is not a created God. He's not a begotten God. He's always been here and always will be. John 1.15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And Jesus says this about John in John chapter 5 and 35. He was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. John the Baptist was a light. Every Christian should be a light. John 1, 6, and 7 says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. So we should shine the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew five sixteen says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Proverbs 4.18 But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So the world is in darkness with their minds blinded to the gospel. But the Christian should shine the light so the sinner can see his sinful condition and see the narrow way. Christians aren't shining the light because they're not putting enough light in. Psalms 119, 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. You need to be ready to answer any question any lost sinner throws at you and just shine the light that you've put in. When you put in the words of God, you get answers for things that people are going to ask. But what else giveth a witness? Jesus' works give witness. John 5.36 says, But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So the healing, the casting out devils, the walking on water, and all the other things Jesus does bear witness that he was who he said he was. And also the Father bears witness. John 5.37, And the Father himself which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. 
you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. They seen his shape because Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. But according to them, they have never seen his shape because they didn't believe that Jesus was God. So when Jesus said they neither heard his voice or seen his shape, he's referring to their unbelief. He's referring to their unbelief and who he actually is. They don't believe Jesus is, Jesus is God. John 8, 18 says, I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. And the Father calls the Son God. He calls Jesus Christ God. In Hebrews 1, 8, it says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The Father said that about the Son. He said, Thy throne, O God. He called Jesus Christ God. Now what better witness do you need than that? Now what is the greatest witness the Lord gives us today? The words of God Himself. John 5, 38 says, And ye have not His word abiding in you. For whom He hath sent, Him you believe not. Do you have his word abiding in you? Uh, Peter, who walked and talked with Jesus, saw Jesus, Moses, and Elijah together, saw people healed, witnessed the death, burial, and resurrection, went to the empty tomb and seen Jesus Christ walk on water and pull him up out of the water. You know, he's seen everything Jesus did during his three-and-a-half-year ministry there. But Peter says in 2 Peter 1.19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. So what he means by we have a more sure word of prophecy is that the word of God is the most trustworthy thing you have. If an angel come to you at night and told you something the Lord said, the Bible is a much greater, reliable, trustworthy, perfect witness than that. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness. All scripture is given by inspiration. John 7, 38 says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus called, the, called what he had scripture, and he had copies of the originals, yet he called it scripture. Jesus didn't just believe that the originals were perfect. He believed what he held in his hand was perfect. Just like if he was holding my King James Bible in his hand, he would call it scripture and he would believe every word. He wouldn't say, well, this word should have really been this or I really meant this or I didn't say that, I really said this. He's going to believe that what we hold in our hand is perfect. Psalms 138 and verse 2 said, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Uh, God is, uh, puts his word on a very high pedestal. John 5, 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The scriptures is what shows you how to get eternal life and what shows you that you have eternal life. And all these people doubting their salvation are usually the ones that never pick up the book and read it. But the scriptures testify of Jesus Christ, who he is, what he did, and how he was. And John 5, 40 says, And you will not come to me that you might have life. We have the word of God, which is straight up supernatural. We have the witness of God in nature. The Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, and still people won't come to him that they might have life. Although they say, I'm going to live my life, or you only live once, or I'm going to live life to the fullest, or they say, this is my life. They don't even know what life is about. It says in Revelation, for his pleasure we are and we're created. Paul says in Colossians, all things were created by him and for him. You were made for him, yet you're saying you're going to live your life. John 5.41 says, Jesus said, I receive not honor from men. 
Matthew thirteen fifty seven says, And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without any honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Jesus said, Marvel not if the world hate you. You know that it hated me before it hated you. And then in John five forty two, he says, But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. All everyone talks about is love and I love God and God loves me and God loves you just like you are. A sodomite wants to get up to sing in church. The pastor says, you can't sing in church. And then a bunch of people say, well, that pastor just hates that homosexual. And then they'll say things like, we're all sinners. And you can't keep him from sinning or you can't keep him from singing just because he commits that certain sin just because he sins differently than you and if you you don't have any bible in your brain whatsoever if you think that it's okay for the pastor to let that sodomite get up and sing that was something that happened around in my town where a, a, a sodomite wanted to get up and sing in a church and the pastor wouldn't let him and for some reason, a lot of Christians sided with the sodomite. They say, well, you're supposed to love everybody. What does that have to do with the sex pervert singing in church? If a man likes little boys, what did he have to be first? A sodomite. If he goes into the bathroom with a little girl, what is he? He's a sex pervert. A sodomite may not like little kids, but that's definitely a gateway to that. And if you really love then you have to hate some things. The Bible says in Psalms 97.10, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Uh, it's, it's not okay to just accept everything and to love everything. You should hate sin. But love hates. If you really love something, you're going to hate something. If you love babies, you're going to hate abortion. If you love little kids, then you're going to hate the sin of pedophilia and the sin of homosexuality. And the sin of rape. You have to hate some things. You can't just accept everything. It's not cute. It's not. A lot of people think, well, sodomites, they're so kind and sweet and funny. No, they're perverts. Uh, John 5.43 says, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. The Lord came into his own, and his own received him not. They looked, out, they looked into the eyes of God and said no. But they'll receive a false prophet and an antichrist and a false teacher and a money-hungry TV preacher. They'll receive those people. And when I sit and hear somebody like Benny Hinn or Joseph Prince or T.D. Jakes, I'm thinking, do people really believe this garbage? It's just a bunch of garbage. And that's what people have in their mind that that's what Christianity is, is T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen and Joyce Meyer and Paula White and Creflo Dollar and the Pope and Billy Graham and all, all this other stuff that they've seen on TV, but that's not true Bible-believing Christianity. Billy Graham isn't true Bible-believing Christianity. He didn't have the right Bible. He didn't say, you know, he said that hell was just separation from God. And sure, maybe he led a lot of people to the Lord, but he probably led even more people away from the Lord too. And John 5, 44 says, How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? In 1 Thessalonians 2, 6, Paul said, Nor of men sought we glory. Are you seeking honor and glory from men or from God. John 5.45 says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. So it mentions Moses. So the law accuses them. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Nobody ever kept the law perfectly, so it always defeats man. Jesus kept it. He fulfilled all righteousness, and the Bible bears witness that he's sinless, and the only way for you to be seen as, as perfect as him is to believe on him and get his righteousness applied to you. 
And then in John 5, 46, it says, For had you believed in Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But they don't really believe Moses. And if Moses was standing in front of them, they would they would have had to hate, hated him too. Moses wrote of Jesus Christ. He wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy. Go back there and read about all the prophecies and pictures and types of the Lord Jesus Christ on every page. And Jesus said in John 5, 47, But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? They don't believe anything that bears witness of Jesus Christ. But will you bear witness of Jesus Christ like the apostles did? Acts 4.33 says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. The devils even bore witness that Jesus was God. In Mark 5.7, it says, And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? So they knew Jesus was the Son of God, which makes him equal with God. The devils know a lot more truth than a Jehovah's Witness who won't bear witness of the Lord or a Muslim who won't bear witness of the Lord. The devils know the truth, but they persuade the cults to teach contrary to the truth. They know the truth so well, so they just twist the truth and get everybody to, to believe something that's false, to lead people to hell. Because they know that's where they're going. As it said in Mark 5, 7, they said, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. So they know they're going to hell. And they're trying to get everybody else to go to hell too. But anybody can be saved. Anybody can come to Jesus Christ and be a witness for him. No sin you commit is bad enough to where you couldn't be saved. I was a horrible wicked person a wicked sinner and God still saved me I still sin I'm still wicked in my flesh there's nothing good about it as Paul said oh wretched wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death there's no doubt about it I probably sin every day in some form of fat or fashion through my thoughts or through something that I didn't do there's many ways you can sin. The thought of foolishness of sin. Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him is sin. Complaining is a sin. You know, it's not just committing adultery and homosexuality and getting drunk. Those are bad sins. But there's all kinds of sins that everybody everybody commits. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the only way to be saved and to get those sins taken away is through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When Jesus was on the cross, he became sin. He became adultery. He became drunkenness. He became pedophilia, homosexuality, all the sins that men commit. And he took the wrath of God. The cup of God's wrath was poured on him. And when you get saved, that wrath is taken away because it's paid for. The Bible says in Colossians 1.14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He died for your sins. He died by shedding his blood. He was buried and rose again the third day. And it's so simple to be saved. Come to him as a guilty sinner that you are and believe on him and what he did on the cross to be the payment for all the sins that you've ever committed and will commit. And only then can you be saved and have eternal life.